My name is John Meyer. I'm a science librarian at the Physical and Mathematical Sciences Library. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the uh, Charles W. Mann Jr. Lecture in the Book Arts, uh, sponsored, and also the Mary Louise. What is it? Cumrine. Cumrine, thank you. Uh, endowment, Library Learning Services, and the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. Uh, without them, we couldn't uh, continue this uh, speaker series of bringing graphic novelists and cartoonists and comic book artists to uh, campus. Our guest today is Jay Hostler, who is an associate professor and uh, artist from, uh, who is a, on the faculty of Juniata College in biology, nearby Huntington, PA. In, this, in addition to teaching courses, he has a number of graphic novels, uh, comics, in the sciences, and uh, we'd like to focus on how uh, nonfiction and science is uh, best expressed through comics and graphic novels. So without further ado, Jay Hostel.
right? I've worked with honeybees my whole life. This is a I, this is a creature. I, a story from my advisor. My advisor was this grand old German professor. He worked with Karl von Frisch in Germany, the guy that figured out the honeybee waggle dance, right? And Harold would always talk his gloves. He would talk like this. And we had we had this uh, parent uh, teacher weekend at Notre Dame, and you know the parents were trooping through. And uh, he said, Jay, I need you to set up a bee with an electrode in the muscle so we can show them action potentials. These are little pulses of electricity that convey information. Right? So I set this all up. And I was sitting there, you know, attentive little breakfast suit, as Harold stood, this grandmaster of the tour. And then, as generally tends to happen, there's always that one um, doctor father in the group who wants to show everybody. This is how silly this all is. You know, and he asked the question, well, why do you work on bees? You know, and my advisor kind of did this. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he says, Jay, you have a bee? And, you know, you have to understand, I spent, I spent three hours setting this thing up, you know, getting just right, getting that. I mean, I've got one electrode into a single cell. I'm watching this. Because I knew exactly what it was going to do. I took the bee, handed it to him, he goes, this is why we work on bees. Because you don't care that I did that. And this is what we're facing. People don't care to step on a bee, right? But in just these last 12 months, we've suddenly discovered how a world without bees could be catastrophic for us, right? <clears throat> So that's, that's where the quote comes from. Uh, we will not fight. And I, and I feel the sense that uh, we are, in general, disconnected from nature. Uh, uh, lots of conservation biologists call this the human exception model. Yeah, that's nature, and then there's us. Right? We're not really a part of that. It's kind of messy. Besides, I don't have cars. Right? Um, <laughs> There are really two, within this category, there are really two things that I'm interested in doing. The first is attempting to share that wonder. Now, there are lots and lots of writers and artists who write about the human condition, right? We, in my opinion, unless they're exceptional, don't need another person writing about the human condition. In fact, I think our obsession with the human condition <laughs> has placed us in a perilous position environmentally, right? Because we're really not going to be worried about the condition of anybody else or fellow passengers. All right? Nature is inherently moving and engaging. Um, I, I cautiously would like to call it the greatest story ever told, but I could get in trouble for that. Because <laughs> there's apparently another one, too. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to share the wonder. There are lots of things out there that I find amazing. There are wasps, for example. Um, whose larvae, as they're developing, never form an anus. Right now, a larva is just this bag of its mouth and a stomach, and it eats and eats and eats, and it swells and swells and swells. And usually, with these hymenopter, an anus forms at the very end, they void, they go through metamorphosis. In this species, it never happens. So what the mother has to do is go through and tear down the new one. <laughs> All right? So, that, to me, is inherently interesting. If your survival as a species depends on mom ripping a hole in you physically, right? You know, and that happens, they can avoid the waste, and they can go through metamorphosis. It's inherently interesting. The other thing interesting about that story is the reason why we laughed is because even though it's profoundly alien to us, we can sort of relate, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure my mom did that at least once or twice. Um, the second uh, is a desire to help us understand, say, learning our place, just because it's a player. You know, really understand our place. Um, and this is sort of a two-pronged thing. Now, science proficiency, as I'll show you in the next slide, is dropping in the United States. Um, this is, this to me as a science educator is a, is a profound concern. Uh, not because I think science is necessarily the most important discipline in the world. 
I mean, I was a liberally trained guy. I mean, I'm reading the Odyssey right now. I actually read the Iliad my freshman year in college about 20 years ago. I just now got to the second half. Um, you know, comic book people are used to to be continuous. Big gaps in time. Um, but that <coughs> is dropping, and, and it's dropping at a time in which technology is profoundly important, and in which, I, I will say this and allude to this number of times, we are at the cusp of a serious environmental problem. And unless we understand our place in that, in that fact, uh, or that disconnect could, well, it's going to be challenging for us. All right? So those are the two motivating factors. Let's see here. Here's the science proficiency problem. 96 to 2000, we have about a 3% drop in high school student proficiency. That in itself, for me, was like, uh, right? my spider senses started tingling. Um, but what was immediately put forth by the, the National Science Board was the fact that what we need to do is start making, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, they say we need to communicate the fascinating and fascination and joy of science. What that means is we need to make it interesting. Um, and <clears throat> We go back to the fact that I believe science to be inherently interesting. What that means is the people standing between the student and science need to make it interesting. Now, the truth is, it's not just the instructor. The student has to come a little bit. However, we are in a situation, 18%, one out of five, um, appreciate or value the process of science. I just have any idea. 20% of our 80% don't really know what the science does or have a sense of its significance. That to me says we have to take some sort of new novel approaches. And I believe one of those approaches can be used in comics. Um, pictures, books of pictures are a good thing. Uh, not always presented as such, right? My wife Lisa found this at a garage sale. Uh, one of the, in my opinion, good things amongst a host of uh, the Detroitists that now inhabits our house. But dynamic biology. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> two pictures, right? <laughs> As two pictures. One is of a ball. I tried to scan it, but it just comes off with this kind of blackish smear. Right? And it's bog from a distance. It's not like a, there's a close up of an animal in a bog. It's, you know, it's squint, and maybe it's a bog or a mouse. I don't know. Right? So uh, it's not really that bad. Again, the content here is very interesting, but this is the, the challenge here is not to interest me. Because I can sit down with a book without pictures and be fascinated. That's not the issue. The issue is how do I fascinate you or how do I fascinate a kid? Especially kids who've already decided that science is too hard or not interesting or boring. Right? So there's the next thing. It's not just that proficiency is down, it's that hostility is up. Right? I, I teach a non-majors sensory biology class at Junior up. Very bright kids. I have these kids in the front and I can see it. I can see the terror. I can see this one, I can still picture um, a woman that was in my class. She stood with her hands flat on the desk as if at some moment I was going to transform into Dr. Jekyll, right? <laughs> Pick her up and shake her and turn around and point at her and look, she doesn't understand science, right? Stock still. She stayed out of her mind. Not because of anything, but because of the content. And I know that because I asked her, like, how did you feel that first day? I was scared. Right? So, <clears throat> proficiency down, hostility up. Right? So it's not just getting them interested. It's getting over that hump of, I hate this. Right? Now what you see is when you look at, when you look at science textbooks now, biology textbooks now, you make these assessments. I make assessments, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, the, the biology textbook that we use is by Freeman. The first thing, the primary thing that made me choose it was the fact that it was experimentally based. Right? So I thought that was really important. Number two, of all the ones I looked at, 
by my favorite figures. Right? The figures, as we're going to see, these are the avenues into the brain. Um, now, comics in the classroom. So we'll skip just a little bit here. Uh, so I've made, I've made a point here for books with pictures, but are comics really a good idea? Um, we were talking earlier about the fact that the night, prior to the 1950s, there was, there was essentially a um, McCarthy era, a mini McCarthy era for comics, uh, in which um, the industry was brought into sharp focus nationally, and as a consequence, adopted um, a self-censorship program that turned a lot of what they do into pablo. All right? Um, prior to that, uh, you could have uh, the kids, kids from the range of 6 to 11, 95% of men were reading, 94, 93% of women were reading. Girls, I guess, they're girls. And they're boys. So, but this is the stat, 1945, that's my favorite. People between, men and women between 18 and 30, you had something like 20% of men still reading comics, and you had 18% of women. So now that's, you, you could sort of, <coughs> within our own current social context, say, okay, kids, uh, girls, 6 to 11, or boys, 6 to 11. But, but women, right, 18 to 30, that's a grown person. What are they thinking? Right? It's a, I got an email from a friend who sent me this Yahoo News that a couple of years ago, uh, some new Japanese senators, senators um, in Parliament got chastised by the prime minister for reading comics in session. And this person said, boy, comics get no respect. I'm like, are you kidding me? Can you imagine Trent Lott reading a comic book in session? This is the quintessential respect of comics in Japan, and really draws a sharp contrast to what goes on here. Uh, a young senator would never dream of cracking open even the best, you know, most artistic. Right? Mouse, for example. Let's take Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Everyone knows Art Spiegelman's Mouse, Pulitzer Prize winner, wonderful book. There'd be no mouse being read in session. What's that? You probably don't. You probably don't. So back in the day, uh, we see some interesting uh, social science experiments and papers. So we've got Hutchinson papers in which he followed a, a, a young teacher, a woman who incorporated comics into her class. And her, she set up a, an entire week based around a couple of comic stories. Right? So the kids were going to read it, and then they were going to do homework. And she complained. Yeah, I'm assuming tongue in cheek here she complained. That made the learning too easy. They all did the reading in the first day. What? I mean, this is unheard of. The reading was done, and then they remembered stuff and they could do the homework. Right? Um, Sonus in 44 showed a pretty nice uh, set of experiments in which you had text, the straight text, compare and a group of kids given straight text. Another group of kids gave the same information embodied in a comic. And those kids that got the comic, the visual component of it, remembered it significantly better than those that not. Another how so you got motivating, there's a motivating medium, they're a great visual medium. We'll talk about why visual is important. They're permanent. Now I'm going to make the, the case for the fact that I think this is the most important aspect of comics, whether they're being used to educate or um, purely for um, self edification you're reading. Right? You're reading it for pleasure. The fact that they're permanent, that you control the pace, right? you essentially, as we're going to see, construct the movement. Um, and so what happens is this becomes a tremendously interactive medium. It becomes separated uh, from something like film in which the high speed of the images, it's a series of images, but the high speed actually assembles motion and meaning for you. It's more passive. And this is something that Scott McCloud talks a great deal about in his book, Understanding Comics. The next thing that's important is that they're intermediary. In fact, my, my work right now, I'm an NSF grant, but I'm just finishing up the book, that focuses on the intermediary nature of comics and how they can help introduce 
difficult concepts using these visual components and help ease students who are otherwise hostile or resistant in some way into this stuff. And the fact, the last is so popular. The truth is, I've worked at a number of papers and I've gotten familiar with people who work at a, a you know, real paper and other student papers. Editors generally don't like funny pages. Consume space, it's expensive. Why doesn't that ever go away? It's because, for some bizarre reason, we do not want to give up our high and lowest, right? Our blondie, we really want to see Dan Wood struggle with that sandwich one more time, right? So they're very popular, uh, whether they're in vogue, out of vogue, competing with a Game Boy or a video game or whatever. You hand somebody a comic, there's going to be some connection, some interest. Let's so talk about the visual aspect of this, especially in terms of science. I would argue that virtually every branch of science has depended upon visualizations to convey ideas to the general public, and in some cases, like finding diagrams in the middle, to actually convey those ideas to colleagues. Right? Uh, when you talk about visual versus the written word, you're really talking about the difference between perceived and received information. So over here I have a wheel or a bar or a, with a series of projections on the edges. Then you could read that, and once you got to the end, you could work on it for a second. That little gerbil, the runs wheel, <laughs> and you might be able to spit out cog. Or I can show you that picture. And you immediately know it's a cog. Uh, in one case, you are perceiving the information. In the other, you are receiving. I could talk to you about Darwin's theory of natural selection, how the idea is, well, you know, an animal that starts here, and then two species split, and so on and so forth. Or he could draw into a tree. And you could suddenly see this amazing idea of radiation, the connection with the idea of a family tree. Right? This is the first one he drew. First tree he drew, one of his trained, I think it was notebook, um, notebook D, as he was working on uh, his theory of natural selection. This is a Feynman diagram. Um, that he whipped up, and I, I don't know the history of that that well, but I do know that it, it became um, a method for making calculations that were otherwise relatively difficult to do, to visualize certain things. And then there's William Smith's map of the strata of England, and this idea that you had not just different layers of rock, but uniform relationships those were layers of rocks. And this became a fundamental idea when it started, we started to get into ideas of the Earth being old and uniformly and slowly made. Right? By the way, if you have questions as I'm going through or want to cry BS on anything that I say, um, feel free to stop me. Um, okay, concepts of permanence and closure <coughs> or subtitle, an animated feature is not the goal. I. I was recently a participant in a, um, in a sustainability uh, day-long seminar, and I got to see and meet a woman named Christina Mittimer, who is a big wig in the International League, League of Conservation Photographers. She gave this wonderful talk. Uh, this is one of the photos. These are the, the Kayapo chiefs. Uh, they're, they're a group. Uh, there's a there's a there's a large Kayapo area right in the middle of Brazil, and there's about six thousand Kayapo, and they live in in clustered villages of anywhere around two hundred individuals. They are the front line against development, uh, and so um, you have the Brazilian government and farmers trying to encroach. And I think she said one of the Kayapo chiefs once said. There have been 45 killed in this conflict between the Kayapo and the Parma Chiefs. None of them were Kayapo. Um, these guys actually got together right, and marched in Brazil on the Brazilian government and prevented the creation of a dam. The electric dam that would have wiped out a huge expanse of their territory. So, so a little bit about the background. She showed these pictures. And these are pictures that are evocative and beautiful, right? And again, there was a person who asked a question. This person said, wow, these are really good. You should make a documentary. You should make them into a documentary. As if the pictures were good, but they weren't quite there yet. 
Well, if you just promoted them to a movie, that would be cool. That would be something. But my wife, Lisa, turned to me and she goes, you know, I prefer the pictures. Because when I look at the picture, I can look at it for as long as I want. I can soak in the entire thing. So I got a chimp, a picture of a chimp sitting there looking at me and look right in its eyes. I can look at its nose for a while. In a film, it's gone. You can't, you're not interactive. You can't, I mean, unless you get it on DVD, you can rewind. But I have complete control with that picture. That's the first thing. The other thing is, so look at that picture, I can tell a story. And that ability to construct a story makes a connection with this chimp I'll never see in my life. Right? It helps me connect to that element of the natural world in a way that I couldn't if it was just zipping by at 25 frames per second. <clears throat> now, what does that have to do with comics? Well, this was sort of like an aha moment for me. And it was really recent. It was just last Thursday. I was struggling to figure out what it is about science comics that I intuitively, my gut felt, was significant and important. Scott McCloud talks about the fact that the gutter, that's the little space between panels, the gutter, in the gutter, human imagination takes two separate ideas, images, and transforms them into a single idea. So here we, on the, on the left, we have meiosis, right? We have one, two, three, four, five panels. Meiosis is the process by which um, gametic cells are made, so eggs and sperm. It's where we sort out our genes, separate them, sort them out again, right? Well, you're not really looking at a meiotic event. You're really not even looking at two cells dividing. You're looking at a circle up there, another circle, slightly different doodads on the inside, a third circle, again, the doodads have changed a carry bit. Now I'm going to have two circles. Where the hell did that come from? Right? And then, look, four. Now, without context, or without you connecting the dots, that's just a string of symbols. However, because it's placed within a con certain context, you connect the dots. Now, suddenly, if you look at it long enough, you know exactly what's happening. The genes are aligning, or the chromosomes are aligning in a certain way. They get separated, pinch off the cell, and you do it again. You have, with comics, the ability to lay out a process, right? physiological event of some sort. That in and of itself is pretty interesting. Science does that all the time. Science uses comics all the time. But what's important, and anyone who does any education knows, that it's not enough to stand in front of the class and say, X goes to Y goes to Z. Bueller, Bueller, right? <laughs> what you have to do, if you want it to stick, is you have to get the kids, or whoever you're trying to reach, to do it themselves. And when you look at a figure like this, you gotta do it yourself. You gotta sit there and say, okay, what's happening between one and two? Okay, okay, I can see that. Okay, now two and three. And in that gutter, as you put those ideas together, you're also constructing a process. And to me, that is the really profoundly powerful aspect of comics, especially in terms of um, So why comics about evolution and nature? Well, the first, I've talked about nature. It's, as I said, to me, inherently interesting. Why evolution? Well, this is a, this is a public acceptance of evolution in 34 countries. It was run in 2005. Can you find us? <laughs> we would be the country between Cyprus and Turkey, right? We currently live in a country, I mean, in which 60% of the people, and despite the fact that all the evidence from geology, physics, chemistry, biology, all ranges of biology, from molecular biology to ecology, point to one explanation for what appears to be the change in life on Earth, and that is life on Earth has changed. And it's still changing, right? 60% of people in this country either don't believe that. I would, I would argue as an evolutionary biologist, it's not really open to belief, <laughs> right? We have the fossils. Um, either don't believe it or aren't really sure. And the truth is that this is really not a debate about evidence. And there's no amount of evidence that I can provide to change anyone's mind. However, um, this is the situation. 
And so my approach is not being a very confrontational person, is the belief that, well, I'm at least going to explain the basics. Right? There's the first problem with the argument. The first problem with the argument is that, um, in my opinion, the other side, and they have opinions of me, and they can take their approaches in my direction, but I am a scientist, so I'm, is that you really don't understand what I'm talking about. And so if I outline it, at least you can make your arguments, and maybe you'll still disagree with me, but at least you'll understand what I'm saying. Right? It's clear fashion. So saying law conventions was the first step in that. The second, this is this is the cover. I just had it colored for optical illusions. I just finished the artwork for this, and this should be to the printer by the end of the month, maybe early November, so early next year, January, so it should be back. This book was uh, funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation, uh, based on the arguments I've sort of already made and the necessity. Um, it is a book about the eye and evolution, and it's designed for a college-level course. Um, it follows uh, the activity of Wrinkles the Wonder Brain, a disembodied brain who likes to point out that that's strange, not as strange as all the people walking around without brains. Okay? <laughs> Um, the story um, is essentially in nine parts. And the premise is that uh, Wrinkles the Wonder Brain is working for the three witches from, from uh, the Perseus legends, the one that passed around an eye and a tooth, right? And they're scientists. And his job as a lab assistant is to ferry the eye between them. And at one point, he trips and drops the eye into a vat of distilled human imagination and must go in after. Um, the title, Optical Illusions, is not in the spelling. Each chapter has him in a little eight-page adventure with a different, within a different context, and each one alludes to some element of eye biology, natural history, what have you. So the first experience he meets Charles Darwin on the desert island. Um, you can only imagine that hilarity ensues quickly after that. He has a superhero-like adventure. He has a mythological adventure. He has an adventure in which the entire story is drawn in a very childlike way. And my two sons, Max and Jack, actually drew some of the figures. And they actually did the preliminary design of the two main characters, Wrinkles. So I let Max draw Wrinkles. And I said, OK, that's the way I'll draw him. And I let Jack draw Mr. Sun, um, who's the character. So I drew him that way. Um, and each one focuses on a different element of eye biology and is followed by six to four to six pages of like a little textbook. So I've got a little, uh, I'm laying everything out like a textbook, uh, the highlighted important words, figures, right? So that these stories, as they go through, each little story introduces an idea, and then I can draw them into a more in-depth um, discussion of those ideas. That was almost done. Um, my approach, introduce readers to the alien world. So this is a page from Planapus. Um, and I draw all the flowers in the morning as being hucksters. Right? Best in the metal guarantee. Take fine nectar, taste the test. Smells good, tastes great. Um, this is really what flowers are doing. Uh, they're luring them in. Right? Flashy colors, pretty smells. They give them a little sucrose reward, all so they can get lucky. Right? With another flower. Um, that to me is a pretty amazing situation. We actually don't need an intermediary to carry our gametes to, you know, the other gender. I won't wait for that. Um, <laughs> uh, the second is connection, the desire to make you feel something about these alien works. I talk about the story where Harold steps on the beam. But I get email all the time now from little kids and adults who read Clan Apis, for example, to their children to talk about how they go, what kind of beam you're feeling. And it's all about this little beam and her life, the beginning and the end of that life. And yet I've got kids and grown-ups crying over a beam, right? right? And in between, I tried to write a story where if I took away the words, what you see are bees being bees. So if you can accept the conceit that bees talk, they don't they communicate, they don't talk. The last is the concept of integrity. 
faithfully representing the beautiful in the natural world, making allowances again for talking bees. All right? Um, the connection here, um, one of the ways I, I like to help readers connect um, is to number one, come up with a bizarre premise. So follicle mites that can talk and live in your left eyebrow. Here's a scene in one of the stories um, in which a giant pimple is erupted near their follicle, full of bacteria speaking an alien language, and this real threat to the follicle mites that it'll erupt. Because what happens is, you know, if you pop those zits, it can actually cause zits to spread. It's the bacteria goes around with them. So they're nervous about that. Right? Again, there's something you, most of us can identify. Um, myths. I have, this is one of the myths that the mites had of Darwin, um, that he filled the oceans during his voyage on the Beagle. The truth is he's just sick a lot, right? But they, they took this event, and they, because this was the body they lived in, this was obviously the source of all things, right? And then hopefully I've created characters that are different, but close enough to us that we can identify. And the last is integrity. So these are pages from the book, um, Optical Illusions. Here's Wrinkles uh, teaming up with Cowboy in a giant eye. Right? So instead of doing the hoary old cliche of shrinking them down and putting them eye, I turned it around and made it a hoary new cliche um, where they're actually in a great big without a guy. And then this is what the intermediary text looks like. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now. Um, because when both of these boys were four, independently, they both said both of these things. You're talking makes me tired, and you're talking about me. So um, I'm going to take that from you. Now, what I've done, and I know I'm going to talk, and then we're going to have some time for other stuff, is I've sort of thrown out what, the why. Um, if you have questions about the how, I have a little duty here where I can draw and show you some things. So if that's what you want your, the nature of your question to be. We can do that. All right? Thank you. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a member of our own Penn State uh, family here. Uh, Jaya Barbado is uh, in the poultry department at the College of Agriculture. And uh, he works in genetics and has made connections with Jay and has experience with his books. And he's going to talk a little more about the university and higher education and conference. How many scientists does Jay think they'll have trouble hearing <laughs> Are they real? Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. These things yeah. drive me crazy. Thank you. I'll leave it here and let it feed back. Uh, I have a, uh, I have a very strange connection to all this. I was going to try to hook up to the internet real quickly uh, because I love the first slide of the dinosaur, and I, I'll, I'll tell you my real, my, I have this ancient connection to comic books. Uh, I actually was one of the first participants in the original Comic-Con series, which I think is up to, must be up to 35 maybe now. And I was actually at the original one. I, I love your uh, lunchbox from Steve Ditko. I actually met him there and we corresponded for a number of years. I met a lot of these people. I had a couple of friends when I was a postdoc at Columbia Presbyterian in New York City. Uh, who did a small, short-run uh, graphic novel in prose about evolution of trilobites, which I thought were wonderful. And uh, it's still I still use pieces of that in my genetics course. I, I currently teach upper-level quantitative genetics, and you can imagine evolution deals very heavily in this. Uh, my connection to Darwin is such that I actually don't think uh, the origin of the species is necessarily his best scientific text. If you wondered, that's the poultry department and not the poetry department. It's a little bit different, although I get mailed to both, so depending on where you mail, how you address your letters to me. 
But actually, I think Darwin's original text before Origin of the Species on the domestication of plants and animals is really where the ideas grew for a lot of what he talked about in Origin of the Species. And of course, I work with poultry a lot, probably about 60% of my time I work with poultry, domestic poultry or birds. And a few years back, I got, after getting tenure, which is a good thing, and I got involved in the freshman seminar series. And this started me thinking, which I probably should have been thinking about before I got tenure here, was how do I connect to my students? I was teaching quantitative genetics, doing the best I know how in traditional fashion, and my registration and my number of students were declining very rapidly, much like the graph you saw online. In an effort to kind of boost my morale, we had several retirements and I got involved in teaching avian biology, which, now there's a reason for all these multiple threats, which will become clear momentarily, so have a little patience with me, which got me thinking more broadly about biology in general, and also it was a lower level course, and again, the need to connect. Somewhere along the line, and I forget exactly where it happened, but I found out about some of Jay's comics, and initially, we always run these contests. I probably have sent more freshman students to the library on library scavenger hunts over the past 15 years than anyone else, except possibly Barb Wade in the US, for those of you who know Barb. And uh, we always look for prizes, and I always hate prizes that say, join the College of Agricultural Sciences, you know? And they, they, kids don't wear them, they look at them and think, yeah, great, good, they can even sell it for an ice cream cone. So uh, one day I found out about Jay's books, and I bought a case of his books on the Sandwalk Adventures because I thought this would make an awesome prize. They were comic books, they were colorful, people think they were cool, and 10 of the students decided to major in biology. They were members of the Division of Undergraduate Studies, and 10 said, I'm gonna major in biology. This is cool stuff. I got to thinking about it, and I thought, hey, this is another way I can help my upper level students. And in fact, I use sections of the Sandwalk Adventures, especially those dealing with natural selection, prior to my lectures on artificial selection, because Artificial selection is natural selection. It's just, and I always portray myself as Darwin because I'm the one making the decisions as to who breeds and who doesn't breed. But fundamentally, the genetic mechanisms are all the same. And I like to think as a result of some of this, uh, you know, I've had a real increase in my enrollment in classes and I start to get people who are actually interested and have gone on to grad school and started thinking about genetics and thinking about it, and I think it really relates, I thought you expressed it wonderfully, it, it relates this connection of the excitement and the enthusiasm that I have that previously was unable to communicate effectively to the students, and I, I'm just fr thrilled for that, and it really has given me an entry in my courses, and it, it's been a lot of fun. Now, I want you to know, I can't draw a straight line uh, with my computer. <laughs> So I have real big issues in terms of being an artist, but I like to think I'm a creative kind of guy. And the minute you accept this idea of using creativity to reach your students, no matter what topical material uh, you're involved with, uh, you can do it. Uh, and I have an interesting, I had an interesting experience, in fact, just gave a talk about how to get sophomores involved in research labs and how to get them to learn information in the classroom. How do you engage sophomores? And this was something with the Division of Undergraduate Studies Advisor Conference about a week ago. And, uh, and again, this kind of follows my progression of saying, okay, we need to get more creative in the classroom. So how, I, I can't do cartoons, beyond, totally beyond me, as much as I love them dearly. I even married an artist in hopes of trying to get somebody to teach me something, and unfortunately, I'm a hopeless case, but luckily she stuck with me anyway. Uh, but here, here's what I did. I've been teaching avian biology 
the worst thing anybody has ever done in the universe when it comes to biology. What's the worst part? You guys had biology probably in college. The worst ever thing you had to learn is anatomy. You've got to learn all the pieces and the parts and the thises and the thats and the muscles have insertion points and origins and they all look alike. How would you ever be able to pick one up and know what in the world it was? Everybody hates it. I have left to me in my laboratory this wonderful skeleton. We call her Henrietta. She's about that tall. And it's the skeleton of a laying hen from 1953. And she's absolutely a little thin, but lovely. And I, one day I started looking at her, and I started thinking, it looks like the dinosaur at the Natural Museum, at the Museum of Natural History, rather. And I thought, why not, in the process of having these kids begin to study avian biology anatomy, why not take the bones from Henrietta and reassemble them into their favorite dinosaur? So, well, now you need bones. So I had to teach them how to make chicken soup so that they knew how to get bones. <laughs> so we now compare a variety of chicken soup recipes in class. We then have to learn all the names of the bones so we know which bones go where. And then, of course, they find that the actual bones from the bird don't really make good dinosaur bones in certain parts of the anatomy. They don't match up. So I allow them to cheat and use like double sets of leg bones and things, but this leads us very naturally in the context of the course to start talking about, well then what is the relationship between reptiles and birds? What is the relationship? How did they get from here to there? How do the changes occur? I'm also cultivating my own group of genetic students as a result of this teaching assignment. But the point is, it's all in the same context. And so uh, I've had a lot of fun. I don't have any really great stuff to say other than uh, this is an opportunity to thank everybody for, uh, thank Jay, really, for getting me going on this path. And if you guys have any questions or anything, we'll be right. I think we're, ask Jay, I don't know much. We're going to sit down right here and uh, try to answer some of these questions. You can look through them first and answer them at your report. I'd just like to also say uh, that graphic novels in general and uh, comics that are reprinted in book form and trade paperback account for $330 million in the publishing world last year, and it's growing. Uh, and so it's become a larger portion of the publishing market, a larger portion of the readership that you may have seen or you may have experienced uh, in bookstores. So it's a much more mainstream than in the past, and that's influencing a lot of the acceptance we're seeing in higher education. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, you can just read them and answer. Okay, so I have here one. Do didactic or pedagogic goals ever threaten the right to power of comics for kids? And the answer to that is yes. Um, I call it the Mark Trail syndrome. I right, ever read Mark Trail? Oh, sweet mother of mercy. <laughs> this is a sparrow. A sparrow. You know, you can almost you can almost hear Monty Python skips, you know. The larch. Right? The larch. And then you hear the request for Ferris Bueller in the background. Um, you know, what a lot of people don't get, and what you see this, you see oftentimes um, agencies using comics and saying, you know what, we'll do a comic because kids love comics. Well, the problem is kids like good comics. Kids do not like crappy comics. And kids have a strong crapometer, right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this, my wife is my biggest fan and one of my harshest critics, next to my kids. And so when I run things by Max or Jack, they're, uh, well, it's a good thing they weren't alive for the Clan Apis book, or it couldn't have ended the way it did um, for the Yuki. <laughs> I was just saying, like, well, it could have, but I would have been persona non grata in my house. Kids like good comics. They like good stories. This becomes the difficult thing. Um, and, this is, and this, to me, is the problem, because what you need in order to do them well is decent storytelling techniques. Well, the truth is, there are a lot of writers out there that can tell decent stories. Um, 
but you have to be willing to couple that with integrity of the material. Uh, I sort of uh, equate it to a tent post technique. I say, well, okay, here are some major ideas that I really I want to convey. Um, these are my plot points, and I have to think to myself, okay, how am I going to how am I going to build a plot around these? Because to me, that's the key. If I want them to remember this, that's be critical for the plot. It can't be a cul-de-sac, right? You can't be tripping along, doo -doo 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 -doo, we're going through nature, we're making our way home, and oh, let's stop and look at this animal, you know? And you're over here, and it's a large, right? A <laughs> large, and then the episode re resumes, right? If it is a cul-de-sac, it, it becomes, it lacks that context that I talked about. But if it becomes critical, so for example, there's a scene. In, in Clan Apis. I love talking about now. I have to tell you the truth, very self-conscious. This is my Midwest upbringing and that of a, sci a scientist. We do not like to put ourselves in there. So when I sit here and talk about all oh, the great things I do, just know that inside there is a cringy, neurotic, north, you know, northern Indiana kid going, oh my god, stop talking about yourself. <laughs> um, the, in, in Kleinapus, there's a scene where uh, Miyuki has gotten separated from the swarm. They're going to a new hive. And this is the place where she meets uh, a dung beetle named Sisyphus. Huh? See? How literate is that? Um, liberal education, baby. Um, and, you know, and she's kind of ill-tempered. She's gotten wet. She's separated from the swarm. She's getting kind of pissy. And um, she's standing there. She's just had this debate that she's essentially lost with a dung beetle. Um, and so she's in a bad mood, and this dung beetle looks up and says, oh, oh shoot, there's a, there's a bird, right? And it skitters around behind its dung ball to hide. She says, I, you know what, I'm not hiding. I'm not hiding. I got this sting everyone seems to be afraid of. I'm going to use it. He's like, okay, but you can only use it once. And she says, why is that? Because if you do, you die. And in the next panel, she's disappeared. She's behind the dung ball, right? <laughs> this becomes a part, that little fact, and she gets back and she's like, okay, you better explain that to me because, you know, I'm new to this. And he can explain it very quickly. But that became, you know, there she was on the cusp of making a pretty big mistake. Uh, staining a vertebrate with spongy skin that would rip that, that thing out. That to me works. I mean, so obviously I wrote it, printed it, I thought it worked. For me that works. Um, you know, just uh, walk along and saying, hey, this is Singapore. Oh, this thing can kill things and will kill us too. Oh, really? Oh, I won't use it. <laughs> That doesn't work very well, right? It has to be a plot point where the kid says, yeah, I'm never said point, and you know what, she was going to sting his birth, and then the dumb girl said, don't do that, and then she hit, and who was close, right? It has to be that kind of connection, in my opinion, just in my opinion, in order for it to stick. The other thing is, it just makes good sense. I mean, one of the things that makes me crazy about some of the things I see in the media is that, uh, so let's take a bug's life, because this is a, an ongoing, persistent uh, canker sore I like to kick. Um, there's a scene where the little ant named Flip walks in to the big city, and this mosquito sidles up to the bar, and orders, a, you know, an O positive, right? So I'm sitting there, he said that, and the first thing I think, what's the first thing I think? Why does he have a man's voice? It's such a simple thing. Just to know a little bit about biology. I see that. There's no male mosquito out there that stains, bites, the blood's for the babies. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Look, I mean, I'm not talking about, hey, let's make a Pixar movie and make it all about, you know, digestion, right? I'm not suggesting that. I'm just suggesting that um, there are ways to make science interesting, to be, to be, have integrity, and still tell a story. I don't really have a philosophical problem with Flick having a backpack made of leaves. I don't think it's fanciful, right? But if you're going to have a mosquito side of the bar, you can think of a woman. What's wrong with that? A woman lush. That's inherently funny. Right? <laughs> I mean, men lushes, oh, they're all over the place. But So, okay. This one? You know, let me, let me yeah. add just quickly. I, I don't know if I need this, but okay. Hey. I don't know how many of you have been here for a while, but the, they used to have a reading list for Penn State teachers, and they were they were called I, I think they were called the Penn State Teacher and then the Penn State Teacher Two. In the Penn State Re Teacher One, there was a reprint of a wonderful study where someone was teaching 
a chorus, and they gave the lecture to different sections of the chorus. They got John Goodman, who those of you, I'm showing my age, but you remember the paper chase. He was the stern lawyer who stood up front and, you know, picked on people. Uh, gave the lecture in his classic monotone voice, never moved, never did anything, and got Michael J. Fox to give the lecture next. And then they gave, but here was the twist. Michael J. Fox gave all the wrong information. <laughs> and then they went back and they tested the kids. And the Michael J. Fox lecture, even with the wrong information, got a better grade. Okay, and they said, well, why? And he said, well, because of his enthusiasm, everybody went back and reread the material and learned from the book, and so they did very well. And what they didn't do in the Penn State teacher was, and, and unfortunately, I am kind of a dick, I, this geek thing. I go to the library, so you've seen me around. Uh, I looked up the follow-up study, and these people were intelligent. They thought, hey, what if Michael J. Fox actually told them the right stuff? <laughs> and lo and behold, of course, those people got the highest grades of all on the exam. And I think this is the real key, is to, is to get that enthusiasm with the correct information in this context. And I think you can't miss. Yeah. Let me follow on something we talked about it at lunch, um, when we talked about enthusiasm. Um, one, of the, one of the things I always tell my students they come into my class. So I close the door and I say, look at you are in an infinitesimally small percentage of the world population that are getting an, 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 an education. You are going to be studying stuff that is, by all intents and purposes, the day-to-day -day life of many people, minutia. That makes you a nerd, makes you a geek. And the only way you're going to succeed is you embrace that. You have to embrace that inner nerd. And I, I make the point to them, the people you see that are successful, I, I always like to use Matt Graham. There aren't too many people more successful than Matt Graham. Matt Graham is a big nerd. It's a big nerd. What? He embraced his inner nerd, he did what he loved, and as a consequence, he's happy. Um, and I think that, you know, even though I wear a bow tie and dance around in front of the class, Kids like me because I'm enthusiastic. If you can be enthusiastic and accurate, whew, what a combination, <laughs> right? Um, okay, how do you come up with characters? All right, let me see if I can draw here for a little bit. Uh, I go to, I'm not very smart. I'll move this. Right. Can I put this on? Okay. Insects wing though, 
are pulled into, I shouldn't say wing, pull. It's Lego, right? And it'll do just fine. You can catch bees out in nature, five legs, four legs, right? Um, they encounter, it's a really nice feature. It's a breakaway leg thing when you encounter birds. Birds, um, you know, a little beak gets your leg, you're gone anyway, right? There are bees out in nature you can find that are missing an antenna. And so this was amazing. Devora is missing part of her antenna. Um, and as a consequence, she's not a forager. Right? So picking the look helps to start um, to guide some of the nature of the character. Um, so because her sense of smell isn't as good, she sits at the mouth of the hive and forages. She's a protector. And in fact, that is her character. She's a protector of the Yuki. She is the older sister who loves her little sister dearly, but this is not a tough love kind of situation. Um, hey, Jay? Yep? Do you refer to photographs when you create your characters and draw, or is it all just from your own memory? Well, a lot of B stuff is from memory, and then what I will do periodically, because what you have is you have drift. You draw, if you've ever looked at peanuts, Charlie Brown looks very different. Oh, yeah. right? Great big head and body at the beginning of the 50s, and then uh, greater activity in human body parts, and then kind of scribbly at the end. Right? Um, so what I do is I go back to photos. I don't have these on hand, um, although I have them in the lab. And sometimes the best thing to do is just look at it again. But if I'm curious, I'll Google uh, something. So in terms of how I develop characters, bees, for example, as I said, Queen Hachi, I took some of the hair, and I just kind of did a little fluff. Because they can lose hair, too. They get bald spots. So I just thought, well, I'll do a little three-pronged fluff mm -hmm. in the middle. That was sort of my cheek. Looks like a, a crown. Zambor. The brother, now this is another neat thing. Um, we are diploid organisms, so we have two sets of each gene. Right? We come from a fertilized egg. Uh, male bees come from an unfertilized egg. So they're uh, a phenomenon as haplodiploid, and that's as much of it as I can explain. Right? Um, but phys physically, look very different. So whereas um, honeybees have this, you know, these eyes that are rolled on the side, a drone, which is what the male is called, have these enormous eyes, a relatively small mouth parts, right? So their eyes are like this. So I created, uh, I created Zambor. Um, uh, and by the way, I, I mentioned this. This is this is Miyuki. That's Swahili for bee. This is Devora. That's uh, Hebrew for bee. Uh, Zambor is Farsi for bee. Now, all the names: Queen Hachi. She is uh, Japanese for being, um, I can't remember. There's a beha, who's a hot tempered uh, 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 chicken. Uh, she's hot tempered. Not all Spanish speaking people are hot tempered. That's not really what I meant. She just happens to be the, the name that she got. But, so the source of the names were from, from around the world. But Zambor um, then became this big eyed, big headed guy. So there are ways of drawing contrast. And what I find is I start visually. I start visually with the character, with a general sort of architecture for what I want them to be. Um, the mice, the mice really look like mice look physiologically. They do not have uvula. Mice do not have uvulas. Uh, so when I draw a mite, you know, it looks like where am I? Not here, not here. Uh, so um, mites have eight limbs, and the truth is, they are absolutely adorable. They really are. They have these long abdomens, right? They have these little pudgy fingers, and then these pudgy legs. Um, they're virtually transparent. They have these annulations along their leg. Like another, now, they also do not have a butt. Now, this is the interesting thing about butt jokes. Now, I know I keep coming back, it sounds so pure island and banal, but the truth is, <laughs> I, you can hit him with all this highbrow sort of science stuff and throw a little butt joke here, man, where's Oh boy, that anchors things and keeps them going, man, where's the next butt joke? It's coming, it's coming. Um, mites are interesting in the fact that they never form an anus. Um, what they do is they sit in your follicles and they have mouth parts that can pierce cells and they draw fluid directly out of the cells. So it's all pre-digested, right? So 
And so they don't generate a lot of waste. What they do generate crystallizes in, their, in this long abdomen. And when they have too much, they die. So I took this form, it's, it's a pretty accurate form, and I, they, they do not have eyes. Okay, so this was a cheat. What they do have are these two little, little internal bumps. And every time you take a picture of them, they kind of look like that. So I place them where those, those bumps are. And then they normally have very little mouths, but I gave them big mouths like that and uvulas, which they do not have. All right, so there is, a, there is definitely a conceit uh, that, that comes into play. Um, so I, that's some characters. Wrinkles the Wonder Brain is just sort of an absurd, pure brain seeking knowledge uh, and that sort of way. So oftentimes it comes from the visual first. So the question is, um, do comics require more attention from the reader or less attention? And would they appeal to people with attention deficit disorder? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think you have to be more attentive. Now, I'm saying this without any data to support that. Well, that's the scientist in me who's saying, yeah. I'm also saying that because the grant that we have um, the, that is funding the Optical Illusions book the biggest part of that grant is money to test this book in the classroom. So we are going to be testing it um, in a number of host classrooms across the nation to see if it's effective at drawing people in. And as we do that, the attention deficit sort of question is actually a really good one because one of the things that we'll be surveying is for people with that problem and their response to them. Um, and so this is really going to be, this book is very much a prototype pilot. The test is a prototype pilot. I'm hoping that the results are somewhat favorable, obviously. I mean, uh, it doesn't make me a, a biased science, a passion science. Um, so it's that I can write a grant, do a full-scale book, and then uh, assess it more uh, comprehensively. Um, so, the, so the answer to your question is, I don't know about attention deficit. I have... I have anecdotal evidence from parents of attention deficit disorder kids um, who say this is the one thing they'll read. Right? So I have a colleague who teaches developmental biology, his son Patrick, very bright kid, got ADHD, um, kept, you know, has trouble getting through crime and punishment, but Randy says he'll sit and read a comic that he hands him. And why is that? I don't know. I, I think the visual component has to play some sort of role in that. Um, in terms of slowing down, speeding up, and that's always going to be the case, I, it does slow things down. Um, if, you, if it's incumbent upon you to look at the image, so read, look at the image, read, look at the image, read, look at the image, it's going to go a little bit slower um, because you're going to be cobbling things together. I would argue, right, at least from a pedagogical standpoint, that's exactly what I want you to do. I don't want you to read it too fast. If you read it too fast, my history tells me you're not retaining much of it. And that slower pace, when I say control the pace, it's not necessarily how fast you get through it. Um, ESL, um, English Second Language, uses use comics a lot because what happens is reading, reading, reading. Oh, it'll get that. We can go back. I read it again. Oh, oh, oh you know. There is no, there is no, um, right, panels here. Um, as far as how you read it, boom, boom, ideally it's this, right? But there could be a lot of this and this. We did a, we've done some eye tracking experiments. So in addition to these and this, I have a line of work that we're, 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 we're tracking the eyes of comic book readers. We showed them Charles Schultz strips. And the hypothesis uh, sprung out of a book I read called The Language of Comics, in which a writer says, silent comics take longer to read because the reader must spend more time with the image. I said, wow, that's a testable hypothesis. And so what we did was we showed people uh, a subject's strips with, um, uh, with text and strips with no text. So you know, Schultz would do oftentimes these silent strips or Snoopy slips or the ball is thrown or something like that. The joke is completely physical. What we found was there's no difference. So there's always four panels. In the first two panels, 
There's no difference between the time spent with the image in the wordless and the time spent with the image in the text. There is, however, a difference once you get to three and four. And two things could have been happening there. There's more time spent with panel three and four in the silent. Two things could have happened. Could have been the, like, oh crap, the ending is coming. I've got to start paying attention. I look at number three, and I look at number four, and oh, I get the joke. Or they could have been like, bum, 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 what the hell, 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 what between panels one and two, two and three, and three and four. One and two are the same, two and three are the same, and three and four shoot way up to the silent, or uh, to the wordless. I keep saying silent. I had my undergraduate look at the, the conference call. Dr. Hassel, they're all silent. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and so what happens is, this goes to the control of pace and assembling meaning. Right? One, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, get the joke. If one poor student spends 17 minutes with a strip, I did not get it ever. <laughs> so, but this student's eye was like, ding, 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 ding. So I'm not, there was something else going on. Um, so when I say control of pace, I do think it is slower for readers, but I think that that control um, um, comes in how you assemble and where you go whether you go back or go forward, which film you can't do. But again, unless you have a DVD player, you can rewind. What else? Anybody else have questions on the comment? Yeah, we, we can take a question from you. Yep. How often do you create your first comment and do you still have that? That's, that's, could you repeat the question? How the old was I when I created my first comment and do I still have it? Um, this is an interesting question because I really didn't do comics. I, did, I drew a lot of pictures. Um, when I was a kid, and, you know, it breaks my heart. My kids, not even remotely interested in dinosaurs. You know, passing fancy, well, humor daddy at the Indianapolis Museum, uh, Children's Museum looking at dinosaurs. But for the most part, we're looking at gizmos and gears and stuff like that. But now, you can walk into Barnes & Noble, and there are shelves of these lush, gorgeously illustrated, computer-generated, you know, beautiful books. I think I had two or three. My parents would get for me any book you know, that they could. You know, two, three, four, five books, Spartan pictures. One, <laughs> still have this one. One of the photos were dioramas. And it was completely wrecked by the fact that I had purchased, they used these plastic dinosaurs that I had purchased just the day before in the basement of Woolworths. And they were hollow, cheap plastic. And here, what they did is they spray painted. For me, there were, there were not enough dinosaur pictures. And so what I had to do was create my own. So this, drew me, this is what drew me to draw. Push me to um, uh, And if you're into like really good drawing puns for kids, Harold, his magic crayon, he drew up his bed at the end. Oh, man, the guy was brilliant. But, um, so anyway, science, sort of, science, my interest in nature, pulled me into drawing in the first place and constructing those things. My mother has a lot of those old dinosaurs. The very first pictures I did when I, when I was three and four, which my mom has framed for me. I drew my grandfather, who was a, a fry cook, and drew him as a scribbly guy with a hat, a truck, and there was something else I can't remember. This. But it wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school that I did my first comic strip, and that was Spaghetti Man. Um, and he had spaghetti powders, you know. So I like absurd superhero concepts. Um, and then really, and that was just something I did a couple times in study hall. And then it really wasn't until my sophomore year in college when um, my freshman year I had submitted a bunch of cartoons drawn on lined paper. And they said, well, they're good, but you have to redraw them on white paper. And of course, I didn't hear anything from this. And said, people take those or not at all. And they said, no, not at all. And I'm like, okay. And then I came back to my sophomore year and the first paper came out. And this cartoon is just awful. It's not funny. I thought, well, at least I can draw it better. I didn't know if I could be funny. Um, I'm sure there are a number of people who are saying they don't know if I can be funny either. But um, I can draw better. And then that, that was the first time that I really started doing cartoons. My sophomore year, and I did miss a deadline through the next eight years. And uh, we were talking about this at lunch. Were those strips? Awful. Terrible. 
can't look at them. But they were great practice in storytelling. And what they really did as I was a graduate student was show me, you know, because I would get response. See, I hope they were awful. I think they're awful now. But the other graduates at the time thought, hey, look, they're great. They're, you know, okay. The fan base is not the best in the world. The, um, the thing is, I, I realized is that I could get, make an impression. I could convey my ideas and put them in a story. I could tell a joke. And so that all sort of informed my teaching eventually. And eventually, the idea of uh, putting these students together. Well, thank you all for coming. We're going to have a book signing, uh, so please stay a little bit, and uh, everyone give a round of applause for Jay. Thanks,